Have you ever been afraid? Have you ever just, you know, look, looked at the situation you found yourself in and you go, God, you know, I'm, I don't know what to do. And God, that's death. That I, I, don't, I don't have the resources within myself, within my experience, to really know how to navigate this time in my life. Have you ever been there? I find myself there, not all the time. But there are times, and I know it's a God thing, because God says this. He says, you, you if you're my child, you must rely on me. Your trust has to be in me, not on your GPS, not in your knowledge, not, not in your, your, your degrees or your experience, but you have to walk with me daily because with that daily walk comes the assurance that, first of all, God is who he says he is because you've got to understand this. God never doubts who he is. He never doubts who he is. He knows he has no limits other than the limits he put upon himself in his character, he's created all things, he is all things, and he's in all things. And he's made it possible for you and I, for his creation, for humanity, to have a life that has meaning and has purpose. And he says, all you have to do is trust in me. All you have to do is believe that I have provided a way to bridge a, a, a real gap between spiritual and death God and death, and I provided a way in my son, Jesus, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. He, he came in the flesh as Jesus Christ, and he died on a cross, and he did that taking the, the, the weight and the sin of the world on his shoulders, and when he died, all, all of sin was paid for for those who would believe. But even more than that, Jesus paid for it all. But he says, you've got to believe. You've got to have faith. And then God turns around and says, guess what? I will provide you the capacity to have faith. I will draw you to myself. I will invite you to have a relationship with me so that you can know beyond any shadow of a doubt that life is in God's hands. John is finishing his letter in 1 John. It's, it's an epistle. It's a letter. It would be like uh, the Pony Express, you know, on a, on a horse riding out and going, here, Dan, here's, here's a letter from John. He's an apostle of God. Or in these days, it'd be a text or an email or, or, or something like that. He probably wouldn't tweet because it's way too long for a tweet. But he'd say, he'd say I've got something I need for you to and more than that, I've got something you need to, to grasp. And hold it, no, more than that, I've got something you need to understand. And then when you understand, you'll grasp it and then you'll allow it to grip you. Because if it doesn't grip you, then you, you will, you, you'll go this way and that way. When life hits you hard, when God allows things to, to, to shake you at the core of your foundation, you will have that rock who is Jesus to stand on. And so John begins this section. It's, it's the very last paragraph of this letter. We've spent uh, spring and summer going through this, and school starts for District 51 on, on Wednesday. So we're going to end this letter, I think, on a very high point because he's just got three things he really wants us to know, okay? And he's going to sum up this whole letter in, in these eight verses. So let me begin in verse, let me turn to it first. Um, excuse me, I'm going to grab the other Bible. I've got papers, pages covering that, and this one here is not covered. Um, beginning in verse 13 of 1 John chapter 5, and it's very sticky because of the humidity in the water. It begins, These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is the confidence which we have before him that if we, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. I'm going I'm to split this. I'm going to stop right here. And I'll come back and I'll, I'll fill in the rest. But he begins with this. Everything that I've said to you, everything that I've written to you, it's so that you will know who you are, 
who you belong to, whose you are, if you will. Because if you're not sure that you are who you say you are, if you profess to be a Christian and you go to bed at night and you doubt your salvation because of maybe your behavior, your choices, he, he's writing this, he's written this to say that, that you can have assurance that you are God's child, that you are in Christ. And he's already told us in the first, first four and a half chapters of this, of this letter, he's told us that, that it's not by our power, it's not by our might, it's by God's grace. It's by what Jesus has done for us, and he's left us and put in each, everyone who believes the Holy Spirit as the seal to assure in our minds that we are who we say we are, that we are his child. I, I, I said this last week. I never doubted that my mother loved me. We didn't get along all the time. We didn't agree all the time. But there was never a moment in my life, in her life, that I doubted that she loved me. And God says, you know, that's a human assurance. That, that's a human response. God said, what if I was to assure you that you could have that for eternity in me because I'm much more than your parent. I'm much more than your spouse. I'm much more than, 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 than your belief and your understanding. I am God and I created you and I know what makes you tick. And I know how easy, especially for Ray, I know how easy it is, Ray, for you to fall for you to question, for you to doubt. But it's not just Ray, it's every person that's in this room. It's every person that's ever been born. God knows who you are, he knows what you need, and he knows how to protect you. And it begins in that relationship. That is, that is the balm. Have you ever burned yourself? I've, I've got a scar, and I think I've showed it to you before. I, I, was, I was, was mowing the lawn, and I, I touched uh, the hottest part of the, of the lawnmower, and it took a good chunk of my, my thumb-ish thing here. And I have a scar, and it's been about 10 years now. And I can still see the scar, but it, it, it pulled everything out. It didn't bleed, but boy, it sure hurt. I mean, and, and it, it did. I mean, it cauterized it and all that stuff. But after about five minutes, it's like, ow. And, and so I go and I grab the burn ointment, and it's like, ow, that's not what I should put on it. That really hurts, so I wash it off with soap, and I go, ow, that really hurts too. I shouldn't do that. And I think Diana got some neosporin, some triple antibiotic ointment, and put it on. It's like, oh, wow, happiness. That doesn't hurt anymore. So you see, for me, it's so easy to put and grab the wrong thing for what the need is. And we as human beings, we think we have the resources to, to, to take away all of the hurt and all the pain that is in this world. And so, so, so for some, it's, let's just say it's legalism. If I just follow all the rules. For others, it's alcohol. For others, it, it might be a relationship. It, it might be drugs. It might be work. I'm, I'm going to fill my life with something other than that which is actually going to make a difference in how I feel and how I operate. Because life is hard, right? It's a, raise your hand if life has been hard for you sometimes. It will. If you haven't raised your hand, it's going to. That's just reality. That's life. But God says, guess what? You can operate. You can thrive. You can be an influence in the lives and the hearts of other people if you'll just do life my way. If you'll lean into me, if you'll lean on me, if you'll trust me. So John begins with this saying, I want you to know if you're a Christian or not. I want you to know without a doubt that you are a child of God. That relationally, you have gone from death to life. From being at odds with God to being in love with God. And then he really does a springboard effect into this. And he begins... Verse, again, so that you may have eternal life. And in verse 14, he says, this is the confidence. So I've written this so that you may know. And then in, in verse 14, he says, this is the confidence. This is what, this is the glue that holds it all together. This is the glue that makes you who you are. So this is the confidence that you have before him. Now, let me go back. 
This is uh, the confidence which we have before him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Okay, so, so the confidence is because we're his child, there are things that we get as his child, right? That he hears us. And there, there's a lot of verbiage in this. But here's the takeaway from, from the rest of this is God hears you. Okay? God hears you. He knows you. He knows if you're his. He understands if you're his, but he hears you. He listens to you. When you cry out to him, you're not crying out to a deaf, worthless God. Because of the relationship with Jesus, God says, I'm always available to you. And here's a, a cooler part than even these words, is that we have that, that person who is the Holy Spirit, who knows us better than we know ourselves. And when we don't have the capacity to speak, or we don't know what words to speak, or or how to phrase it, he does it for us. He interprets us. And I think he does it for us. Because God doesn't need him to interpret anything. He knows every, every bit of us, everything there is to know about us. And yet the, the assurance is, is, is for us. The Spirit isn't here for us so that we know, first of all, that we are his child and that God is available to hear us and that God even when we have nothing that we can think of to say God still speaks for us I just say how cool is that I, I, I've stuttered since I was I was like three years old I you know in, in elementary school I took the stuttering classes and all that and all I did was just, 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 just stutter more I didn't I just made that up but I stutter and I still stutter today but you know they they tried to teach it out of me It just didn't work. I, you know, I've been able to manage it some as an adult, and because I, I talk a lot, you know that. And yet, I've learned to, to deal with that. I've learned to live with that. I did what I could do, and then it's like, you know, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna go on with life. If I stutter, well, you know, so be it. If it bothers you, well, that's kind of your problem. So what if we did that in our Christian life? I'm faithful to God. I love God. He saved me. I'm following him. I'm in his will because I love him. I'm following him. I adore him. I'm in a relationship with him. So I'm seeking after the things of God. And if you don't, I'm not trying to be mean. Please don't hear this. If you don't like that, too bad. Because the hard part is, is that if I'm pursuing him, and you're not, then we're going in a different direction. Right? And so, because we're in the same family, the family of God, we're in the same boat, or if you're on this side and it, it's capsizing and you need to be on this side, then you've got to be attuned enough to know, well, I, I've got to get back on the right side. Or something's not right. Does that make sense? And so God says, you know you can know. And here's, here, here's one of the ways that you know. Is that when, when you ask according to his will, there is no limit to what God will do. But you can only ask for what's in God's will if you know what God's will is. And so let me just back up to the very, very core of, of this text. And, and the Apostle John this is the, the, the foundation. You got to love God, right? And what's the other half of this? Got to love others, right? So let's, let's just say it. Love God. Oh, I didn't say it loud enough. Love God and love others. One more time. Love God and love others. That's where it all begins because our relationship with God was born out of love. God's love for his son. God's love for his creation. And so God says, you love me, and, and trust me, I know how many times we've said this in the last six months. But if you love me, I'll give you the capacity to love other people. But if you don't love other people, and you don't want to love other people, then it's impossible for you to love me. So they're hand in hand, they go together. I don't have the capacity to love who I don't love. But God says, guess what, Ray? I'll give you the capacity. I'll manifest that in you so that you can know 
beyond the shadow of a doubt that I'm working in you. Because see, it doesn't matter how hard I try. I'm going to fail. You are going to fail. So it's about being submissive to the God who created you, being submissive to the God who saved you, and trusting in him enough to habitually walk with him. Because everything that John writes in his letters, it's about a habitual way of life, a way of living, a way of choosing. I told some folks um, on Thursday, I I was talking with a group of about 13 people, and it's like, I I try to live a God-centric life. And one one of the people said, well, explain that to me. And I said, I believe that God is in everything, is worth everything, is everything. That he is my master, he, Jesus is my king, that without him I wouldn't be able to live, I wouldn't be able to breathe because he gave us all that we need to live. He created this earth, he created the world. If there's aliens, he created those too. We're not smart enough to know that. And so I live a God-centric life, which means I'm always conscious of my limitations. See, we didn't sing, I am God. We sang, you are God. Because we're not, we're his creation. And so I know that I'm not the be all to end all in my life. And that God has a purpose and a plan for me. And so everything that I, 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 I do, I strive to do it for the glory and honor of my savior, of my God of God. And if if there's others in in the faith that that don't do that, then then that's where a lot of the the issues come from because we're going in different directions. And it doesn't mean I'm not going to fall. I'm not going to fail. God knows. (laughs) Again, you know me. We all fall short of the glory of God. Yet I have never once doubted that God loved me. When I made my profession of faith since that day, so many years ago, I've never once doubted that I belong to God. Even though I crashed and burned, I walked so far backwards, backsliding, and no, no, that, that, that wasn't the term. It was turning around and running away from God to do life my way. And yet when the time came and when, when, when I repented and I turned back to God, he was there with open arms. Because he loves me. And I love him. And I'm one of his kids. Just like you are if you're his kid. Well, let, me, let me finish this up. I I, I want to be very clear. Verse 15 is a tough verse, okay? So I'm going to read verse 15. I don't don't remember if I read it already, but I'm going to. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. I got to tell you, I did a lot of of research on this, and this verse 15, almost every commentator ignores. Or they try to loop it into 14, 15, and 16 with never answering the question of what do you mean if I ask the request has been answered? Is that a question someone would like the answer to? Okay, they know it. Okay, no, don't worry about it. No, of course you want to know because we pray to a God who says he hears us, right? And John just said, well, you have a God who hears us, and if he hears us, then he's going to grant what you request, right? So let's go back to 14 really quick, and I know I'm, I'm going backwards for a second. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, and you got to circle his will, okay? Because that's, that's the, the pin for here. This, this, is, the, this is the tie, If we ask anything according to his will, that's not the thing. He hears us, okay? And if we we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have requests which we have asked from him. So when you ask for God and you're in a relationship walking with him and, and live according to his will and his ways, then what you're going to ask for and what you're going to pray for is going to be governed by his will. It doesn't mean that we're not going to ask for 
Teslas or a billion dollars. But then we have to go back and say, you know, God, <laughs> well, here, here, here's what I have to do. God, why would you ever give that to me? I'd be so irresponsible. God, you know better. I could ask till I'm blue in the face. God, God, your word says that, that if I ask, you'll give it to me. And God would say, what, do you think I'm stupid? Do you think I'm ignorant? I'm giving you what I deem you need, not what you deem you need. And the only differential is, is that walk with him that we talked about earlier. That it is a pattern, a way of life, so that as we're growing and as we're maturing, that we're learning and wanting to know the ways and the will of God so that we live and act and ask accordingly. So this is not a carte blanche, well, I want a billion dollars, God. You said you'd give it to me. That's not what this means. And every time you read something that says he will answer your prayers, it's always grounded in us having the right relationship with God. I mean, has, has anybody ever asked you for something? And, and you, you know, let's, somebody comes up to you, I have a need and, uh, you know, I need $2,000 because of, because of this. Would you give it to me? Now, now my initial response is absolutely not. Well, because I don't even usually have $2,000 to give you. But, you know, it would be like, okay, well, hold it. Why do you need it? Well, I just need it. Well, I need to be tall, and I'll never be tall, so tell me, why do you need it? What's, what's the purpose? And, and you know, sometimes they'll, they'll be honest. Sometimes they'll be open, and they'll say, you know, I have this, this, and this, and, and, and it's like, well, is that reason enough? I mean, should it, is, ew. see, I'm a steward. We're, we're, we're stewards, not just of money, but of time, of, of, of all things that God has granted us. Is, is this what I, I should do? And so what I do, do then after my initial no is, God, what would you have me do? God, I, I see this person, this person's legit. God, I, I, I how, how do I... Well, no, God, should I meet this need? God, what, what should my response be? And so often God says, Ray, meet that need. But God, I can't call someone who can help you meet that need. You're, you're a body, you're a family. There are people that have what you need to meet this person's need. But you know, there's been times when I'm driving, and you know I'm an angry driver most of the time, and there'll be someone on the side of the road that's got a sign that says, we'll work for food, or my child's whatever, my dog is this, and, and you, it just, no, please don't judge me. But I, I've dealt with so many people, it's like, I'm not even gonna look your direction. And there are times when God says, Ray, look. Ray, absolutely look. They're real. It doesn't matter if you don't understand what the need is. I want you to see the need. And there have been other times in that same situation when he said, get out your pocketbook, Ray. Get out your wallet. Well, God, all I've got is change. Well, give them your change. I want you to do what I'm telling you and leading you to do. See, that's, that's, that's the key, is being willing to let God direct your paths. Well, let me, I know I said I was finished this, and I've got on, on a wild, I'm going to stop. Because I'm not going to rush through verse 16 through the end. Because this, that puts a nice bow on it. But I want, I want you to think about this. 1 John 1, 9 says, if you confess your sin, he is faithful to forgive you of all unrighteousness. He's faithful to forgive you of all your sin. And you know what that, that looks like? 
It looks like a restoration in your soul. It's like you feel, I'm an emotional person. If you're not an emotional person, an emotional person, that's fine. But I'm an emotional per person, and, and I visualize this. When I get on my knees and I get on my face before God, and, and, and I repent and I confess my sins, I feel different. You might not. I feel different. There's a calming that takes place. There's a refreshing that takes place in my mind. And I, I, I so want to do the third person thing. And Ray, and in Ray, but in me, I know that I've been faithful. And see, that's what God desires from all of us is a faithful life pursuing him. Knowing that he's faithful to answer our prayers because he does hear us. And as we walk and as we grow, then we stop asking for idiotic things. But even when we do ask for idiotic things, he still hears us. He's just shaking his head no and saying, when is this boy going to learn? So God always hears. He, he, he's given us life in Christ. I mean, again, John 3, we're, we've been born again. Paul says in 2 Corinthians that we're new creations. God, God's re, remade us. Everything's redo now. You know, there's a, a Top Gun, it's a Maverick, I know, but Top Gun redo. We're going to redo what was really popular back in the, whatever, the 80s or 90s. And oh, and guess what? We have a brand new uh, milkshake. It's vanilla redo. It's just vanilla. But God says, you know what? When you confess and you repent, it's not a redo. It's a restoration. It's a restoring. David writes in Psalms, God restore to me the joy. And that comes when we confess our sins and we repent of our sins. He gives us that, that, that innate ability to go, thank you, God. But when we harden our hearts and we say, God, it's my right to be angry. It's my right to do this. Then even speaking those words separates you from the right relationship with God. Because the only right we have as believers, if you're a believer, is to honor him. My right as an American never, never, ever is more important than my devotion to God and my need to honor him no matter what politics are, no matter what, what my background is. God's always bigger than my belief. God gives us our faith and out of our faith comes our belief. And here's what he says I want you to believe in. I want you to believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Okay? And build your life on that. Build your life on, on, on the one, capital O, the one who gave his life for you. John said, I write these things to you so that you'll know, so that you'll have the assurance, and, and then in 14, that you'll have the confidence so that you'll know without a shadow of in any kind of doubt that you're his child. And let me just close with these three words. That is enough. Father, thank you for your word. God, I know I, you could, I can talk till I'm blue in the face. And yet, God, so often you just want us to be quiet. You want us simply to hear from you, to let your spirit move in us, to encourage us, to convict us to do those things in our, in our lives, God, that, that we can't do for ourselves because we are so blind, so free to who we are and to what we do. And so, God, I pray this morning, Lord, that we simply would take the time, number one, 
to know that we are who we say we are. God, you say that we can know. And so, Father, I pray that we would be faithful, Lord, in confessing our sin to you. Not beating ourselves up. Not, that's, not, that's not what this is about. It's about being honest to our Creator, honest to our Savior, knowing that Jesus gave everything for us. Father, that we would know that it's not simple salvation, but it's a relationship with a God who knows, a God who hears, and a God who understands, and a God who says, I, I make a difference in the world, and I make a difference in your life. Trust me. Talk to me. Commune with me. Converse with me. Don't just pay lip service to me, God would say. Let's make it real. And so, Lord, that's my prayer this morning that we simply would make it real, that we would be so transparent before you, God, knowing that you see us anyway. You, you, you see right through us. We're only fooling ourselves. So God, may we all be God-centric, Jesus-centric, knowing that he paid it all and that we owe him everything. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. So we're gonna sing a song. If you'll stand with me. You know, I, I, don't, I don't know where you are. I know what you need. You need to be in the right relationship with God. Uh, I don't know everybody that's here this morning, but if you don't have a relationship with God, it's really simple. You have to admit that you have a need for God, that you're a sinner. And let me the Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Everyone, all means all, all people, every... So you have a need. You have to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the one who gives us life. We believe in him as God's promised Savior. And then we have to confess our faith in him. So it's simple. We, we teach this in, in, in Bible school. Lord, I, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus is God's son and that he died for me. God, I don't understand all of this, but God, you do, and I believe. And God, I'm trusting you, confessing Jesus is Lord. So if, if you're a non-believer and, and you're, you feel that need, I'd love for you to come and talk to me. L let me share Jesus with you. And if you're a Christian and you've just simply been being the ping-pong Christian, just doing whatever you feel like whenever, that, that's, that's no life. That's all, eventually it's going to fall off the table. Swing and you're going to miss. So let's just say, God, forgive me. God, restore to me the joy of my salvation. And we're going to sing a, sing a song called All to Have a wonderful week.